Previously, we looked at all the options available under the Configure System menu, and they're all primarily involved with configuring the Zone Director. However, I pointed out that there were some other menu items that we need to think of, the alarm settings, WIPs, certificate and location services that also relate to the controller settings, and we'll look at those now. We begin then with the alarm settings, which is way down towards the bottom of the Configure menu, and I'm going to put the screen resolution up to 150 so that you can see a little bit better. Don't forget that the actual button for alarm settings is way down there on the left hand side. So here are your options for the alarm settings. The first is the email notification and if you want email notification for any alarms that uh, occur then you need to tick the box here but don't forget you also need to have in the system settings the email server configured. So we'll just scroll down there within the system settings and we see the email server here. So we need to configure that. And don't forget, this is the same email address that's used for guest pass. So you need to have an email address that's going to be uh, compatible with both of those functions. The second thing within alarms is the events that will trigger the sending of an email message. And we can see here all of these different options are ticked by default. And this is the event that will be emailed out. Now, this is nothing to do with the events that are recorded in the event log. This is just the events that will cause a trigger. Now, if you do receive an email regarding an alarm event, then you will only receive it once. If that event happens subsequent to that, you won't keep getting an email every time that happens unless you go into here, into monitor, and then scroll down to alarm events and within alarm events here you will see a list of the events that have been in emailed out to you and if you clear the event then you will get subsequent updates if that event reoccurs so just bear that in mind after alarm settings we look at WIPs wireless intrusion detection and prevention system first option we'll see is denial of service and we've got two choices here by default, the first one is not ticked, and that's protect my wireless network against excessive wireless requests. Well, one of the ways that a potential attacker um, could gain information about a network is to send excessive probe requests and management frames. And so anybody that does this will be ignored by the system, i.e. their frames will be dropped. Second option is to temporarily block wireless clients with repeated authentication failures. Now, it doesn't necessarily indicate that somebody's hostile or mounting some kind of attack against your system. But what it does do is it just ignores devices that are unable to authenticate, that are trying to get into the network, even if it's got a valid reason. We can block them for a period of time that goes from 10 to 1200 seconds, and the default, as you can see, is 30. Clients that are temporarily blocked by this setting don't get added to the blocked clients list when we go to configure access control and we look at the blocked client section which we'll look at later on so they're just basically ignored. The next option is intrusion detection and prevention and this is using information that the zone director receives from background scans from the access point. So the first option is enabled by default and that's enable report rogue devices. But before we look any further into this, let's make sure we understand what a rogue device is. Well, it begins with a look at our managed access point. So this is an access point that's managed by the zone director. Well, of course, there are going to be other access points in the environment that the access point is going to sense. Now, these are just other people's access points functioning normally, but we detect them and we mark these as rogue access points. They're not malicious, they're just access points that we've had to detect in the local area. However, there are access points that do display behavior that can be regarded as suspicious. And when we detect those, we class them as malicious rogue access points. Now, this will be an access point that's displaying either SSID spoofing, copying a known SSID that we are using. It's on the same wired network, it's MAC spoofing, so it's copying a MAC address, or it's user blocked, and that's an access point that we, as the administrator, have marked as rogue. By default, all rogue access points are logged. Well, I mentioned that the access points detect rogue devices, 
by using background scanning but of course we don't have any access points connected to this control yet but I do have some access points connected to another controller and under monitor rogue devices we can actually see the rogue access points that this controller has picked up so I have an access point connected to the controller functioning normally and it's identified some access points in the local area now these aren't malicious these are just neighbor access points but they're still identified as rogue because we've set that setting to enable us to detect all rogue access points if I click the plus sign next to one of the detected rogue access points it tells me which access point actually detected it and it tells me about the RSSI which is the received signal strength so that's an indication of how close that access point is well I mentioned that these are really all going to be neighbor access points so there's nothing particularly malicious about them but I do know what they are so I can click them as markers known and then it will be taken out of the log and this access point uh, that's listed as malicious was actually a printer and so that's been highlighted as being a device that's on the same network I was setting it up yesterday it had Wi-Fi capability so it's been flagged as malicious and so I can again mark that as known and there we go into our known recognized devices um, something else we can do is if we pick up a device that we actually uh, recognize as a malicious and it's not been marked as that we can flag it as malicious and then the wireless protection will come into play with this and again we'll have a look at how that works later on so we can see what happens when we have report or rogue devices enabled it means that we're going to pick up and log any neighbor access points that are just access points in the area and they're actually completely safe we can choose to report only malicious rogue devices and this is the devices that we looked at previously that are SSID spoofing they're on the same wired network they're Mac spoofing or they use a block which is access points that we've designated as malicious but once we start getting that information we can also choose to protect the network from malicious rogue access points well let's take a moment now to think about how that works when network protection is enabled we have our own access points that are just operating as normal we then detect something that we regard as a malicious access point according to the criteria that we've set if we detect a client that's connecting to the malicious rogue access point and we think it should be connecting to us then we'll send a deauth frame and we will make the deauth frame look like it's come from the malicious rogue so the client station will respect that deauth and not connect to the access point one thing that we do have to be careful of is that deals sometimes can catch out networks unawares and we're actually dealing clients that are legitimately trying to connect to an alternative access point and we're putting up a denial of service for a network that actually isn't malicious in some countries this can be legally questionable so please do make sure that if you put this into operation that you know what your local regulations are and that you're compliant with them so the final thing that we'll see under WIPs is the rogue DHCP server detection as you know a rogue DHCP server can cause problems for your existing DHCP services so it's good to have a method to alert you if a rogue DHCP server is detected very straightforward and that's the end of everything that's under WIPs next we go to certificate now certificates are relatively straightforward here you can generate a certificate signing request now why do we need this of course if we look up here on the top left we can see that the certificate is not secure and that's because we don't have a trusted certificate in there if you are going to be doing any sort of public services or authentication services then it is a good idea to have the controller with a certificate you can get some more information on the certificate signing request here and it will guide you through how to generate a request now once you've got your certificate you can import it and then the certificate will show as a trusted certificate this is showing the current certificate which is the cell signed certificate that the controller makes during the system setup 
We do have one or two advanced options to do with the certificate services, but this is really for people that understand certificate services. Uh, we're not going to go into it too deeply here, but this is just a little bit of extra information that you would need to have a look at, including backing up your keys and your trusted CA. If you know about certificates and you're comfortable with certificates, then you won't have any problems here. From certificates, the final place we will look at in this section is location services. Location services is something that you use in conjunction with Rucker Spot, and this configuration is really covered under the Spot training. So unless you're working with Spot, then you don't need to worry about this configuration option here. And that brings us to the end of this module on some of the configuration settings that relate directly to the Zone Director.